Hello, my name is Matt Anderson. I'm the curator of history at the Sioux City Public Museum. Uh, and I'm going to host a, a virtual tour with, with you today. Uh, right now, the museum has an exhibit uh, detailing the history of the women's suffrage movement. So the campaign to, uh, to obtain votes for, for women, uh, which spanned the years from the 1840s until, until the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Uh, and we'll, we'll, what I do encourage everyone to do uh, is to visit our museum, our Sioux City Public Museum webpage, uh, and you can get access to a couple of PowerPoint presentations that uh, I've put together that really detail the history of, of the women's suffrage movement and, and specifically with the events that happened here in Sioux City itself. Uh, and it's a two-part uh, two presentation, uh, and that'll really give you kind of the detailed uh, story of, of the, the long struggle to, uh, to obtain votes for women. Uh, but today what I want to do is go kind of on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis and, and talk about some of the three-dimensional artifacts that we have on display uh, to, to go along with that story. And, and there's some things that are just uh, generally related to women during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, and others that are more specifically uh, related to the women's suffrage movement. So I'm not going to talk too much about the, the suffrage story itself, but uh, just we're going to focus in on the, on the artifacts. So we're going to start right out. Uh, the kind of the first uh, case of artifacts we have is a is a costume case that has various clothing a, a woman in the 1880s uh, would have would have uh, worn. Uh, and what we have here, I'm going to, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Um, First off, we have a dress that belonged to Flora Whiting, who was from Mapleton, Iowa. And uh, as you see, Flora was a, a very small lady. Uh, this is one of the, the smallest adult uh, dresses we have in the entire uh, public museum collection. Uh, it's, it, but it's a, a velvet dress, a velvet trim dress. And it, as you see in the 1880s, the corset was still very much in vogue. And so it's very tight fitting. Uh, and this was also the era when the bustle was still in play on, on the back of, of the skirt. And so, uh, and that would kind of end in the, in the, in the 1890s, the bustle would, would go away. But, uh, and I, you will see that clothing becomes gradually less restrictive for women as we get closer to, uh, to the, uh, the 1920. And I think that is something that, you know, take what you may from that. I think that's something we, that, uh, uh, maybe shows how the, the role of women in society was changing during this period is how you know practical their clothing was. Uh, you also see behind we have a we have a uh, a really cool uh, beaded uh, purse in the background. These were pretty common in in the late nineteenth century. Sometimes they were handmade uh, or they could be uh, purchased in stores. This one has a, a floral motif to it. Uh, the hats in the eighteen eighties were generally kind of small bonnet type hats like the three you see here. Uh, a lot of times you'd go to your local hat store or milliner as they were called and, and buy a small uh, straw hat and then you could buy different types of trimming. So like you have a floral trimming there, you have different types of uh, beaded uh, jet beads on the, on this particular example and more floral trim. And you could buy the, the silk uh, bows and things like that. As far as footwear we have here, we have a couple we have, we have a pair of, of women's boots, uh, which were still uh, widely worn uh, from, you know, all into the early 20th century. And so these are uh, lace-up style boots. Uh, and then we have uh, some some slippers here as well. And this is pretty early on in, in the era when, when uh, shoes were being manufactured uh, to go on a specific foot. So you had a true left and, and right shoe, which uh, in earlier periods wasn't necessarily the case. Okay, let's go ahead. I'm going to zoom back out. And we'll go to the second case. And now we're going to get into some uh, artifacts that are, are specifically related to, uh, first off, to, to early women's groups here in Sioux City. And, and for the most part, these groups, uh, in, it, they, they, were not, they, they were not suffrage groups, but eventually they would lay the groundwork uh, for uh, kind of local support for, for the women's suffrage movement. Uh, and there are a few other uh, uh, items that I want to point out in this case as well. I guess the first thing actually I want to focus in on is this, we'll go here to the back, um, is, this, uh, is, is, is this program. 
And this is for a Masonic banquet that was held at the uh, Academy of Music Hall. And the Academy of Music uh, was, was Sioux City's first big concert hall. Uh, it was built in, in 1870 uh, and opened in early 1871. Uh, and it, it was on the south side of 4th Street uh, between Pierce and Douglas Streets. Uh, and this was the venue where, uh, where Susan B. Anthony uh, spoke when she first came to Sioux City in 1871. So uh, the Academy of Music, it held about 800 people. Uh, and, uh, and, and Susan Anthony uh, spoke there in, I believe, June of 1871. And, and the, the venue opened that January. Uh, and then this, this uh, program that we have here, this is from uh, December, I believe, of 1871. So, so we, have a, we have an artifact uh, related to the venue where, where, Anthony, uh, where Anthony spoke when she came to Sioux City. Uh, and then when she came back to Sioux City in 1877, she spoke at the, at the same place uh, again. So that's one of the earlier artifacts we have for this exhibit. Uh, in, in this part of the case, we, we have, a, a, first off, there's a, there's a little uh, um, velvet purse in, in the middle uh, that, that sort of would go with the, the clothing that we saw in that first case. Uh, and then I wanna focus down at the, toward the front part, bottom of the, of the picture here. Uh, this is a, this is a fairly damaged uh, program from an annual meeting for uh, the Sioux City branch of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Uh, and and this was a very this the the biggest and most powerful women's organization of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, it, it started in 1874 nationally, uh, and then the Sioux City branch uh, started in 1878. And of course, as you probably guessed from the, from the name, the the WCTU was was uh, concerned itself with the prohibition of alcohol and was one of the leading. Uh, organizations that uh, that pushed for and eventually obtained the the national ban on the sale and distribution of alcohol, which uh, uh, was in effect from 1920 until 1933. Uh, but the WCTU, in addition to being uh, uh, focused on on uh, prohibition of alcohol, uh, was an early supporter of women's suffrage, and, and I, I think for probably fairly obvious reasons, they believed that uh, women would be supportive of prohibition, and so. Beginning by uh, around 1880, uh, especially after Frances Willard became the, the national director of the WCTU, uh, they, the, it really supported the women's suffrage movement uh, throughout, throughout the United States. And, uh, uh, and so they were, they were early supporters of women's suffrage. Now, in behind that, we have some programs from uh, the Unity Club, uh, and, and Unity Circle. And these are two organizations that came out of Sioux City's uh, First Unitarian Church. I, and, the, and the First Unitarian Church was a, uh, was, was a fairly uh, liberal Christian uh, denomination. Uh, and it, it was in Sioux City, it was brand new. The, the local Unitarian Church was founded in 1885. And they chose as their first minister, uh, Reverend Mary Safford. And so they had very unusual in the late 19th century to have a female minister. Uh, for, for any church. And so, and not only did they hire Mary Safford as, as the lead pastor, they hired um, Eleanor Gordon uh, to, be her, uh, to be her assistant. So they were led by two, two women. And one of the first things that uh, Safford and uh, Gordon did uh, when they, when they uh, took over the, the leadership of the Unitarian Church here in Sioux City was form the Unity Club. And Unity Club was a male and female uh, um, study club basically so the, the the members of the club would uh, would write papers and then give uh, programs on on all kinds of topics in history science uh, uh, any any number of things uh, philosophy uh, and and it, it quickly grew a number and so uh, this was this was it was kind of a forerunner of some of the women's clubs of the literary clubs that began to form in, at the beginning of the 1890s uh, only unity club included both men and women now, Unity Circle was the Unitarian Church's Ladies' Aid Society, and it was more focused on uh, social betterment here in Sioux City. And so they, they would do uh, different types of programs that would help the, uh, uh, the poor in Sioux City or uh, maybe do some type of other civic improvement project. And so, so that was, was the Unity Circle, and that, that, that was a, a women's group uh, specifically. And the, so... Uh, the Unitarian Church uh, was was early advocates of of uh, women's suffrage here in Sioux City, and uh, Mary Safford and Eleanor Gordon would 
both go on to be the uh, leaders of the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association, which was Iowa's uh, leading uh, suffrage organization. Let's go on to the other side of this case. We have some more uh, early uh, women's groups in Sioux City. Probably the the earliest uh, um, the earliest women's organization that uh, uh, that formed here in Sioux City and uh, became quickly very influential was uh, the Women's Christian uh, Association, uh, and it formed in the early 1870s. And it was focused on all kinds of, it was, from its beginning was focused on uh, uh, social welfare and civic improvement uh, 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 goals. And so th th for instance, uh, they ran a, what they called the woman's home, uh, which was for uh, women, sometimes for women who wanted, were trying to escape prostitution or maybe uh, unwed mothers. Uh, they, they eventually found, uh, established a foundlings home. And those two organizations developed into Sioux City's Florence Crittenden Center, uh, which was uh, uh, operates to this day and helps uh, single mothers and and uh, and families in need and, and children in need. Uh, so uh, the, the Women's Christian Association was associated with that. Uh, and then when Sioux City's first hospital was formed in 1887, uh, it was it was founded by Dr. William Jepson, and he. He asked, he approached the Women's Christian Association to actually run the hospital, and it was called the Samaritan Hospital, uh, and it was it uh, was located at 17th and Pierce Streets on the west side of 17th uh, of of Pierce Street, uh, north of, of 17th Street. Originally in a house that was there, and then eventually you can see the um, the, the the building in the center of this uh, paper. Uh, that that was built a, a few years later in the early 1890s, and that was uh, the the, uh, the hospital. Uh, and so the, the Women's Christian Association ran to City's hospital. The, you know, the doctors would come in to help patients and, and, uh, and, and service patients at the hospital, but it was the, it was the women of the w Women's Christian Association that actually ran the, the hospital from the business end uh, and the staffing end and that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, as a related note, uh, Sioux City's second hospital, which was St. Joseph's, uh, that was uh, run by the. That was also founded by Dr. Jepson. Only in in that case, he uh, approached the Sisters of Mercy, uh, which were a uh, uh, a, um, a a sisterhood in the Catholic Church uh, that that specialized in in running hospitals, and and they ran uh, the the Saint Joseph's Hospital. So both those two cities' early hospitals were actually run ran uh, by by women. And became an important, uh, uh, an important uh, way that uh, women gained uh, important social standing in Sioux City in in, in its early days. Uh, here in the, we'll zoom back in. Actually, uh, in, we also have a a, um, a a certificate that from the Women's Christian Association uh, signed out to George Weir, who was an early banker here in Sioux City. Uh, he supported the organization, and so here we have uh, one a certificate that they gave to him around 1900 uh, for for his support to to their organization. Uh, another type of a very different type of organization that was popular in the uh, late 19th century were were various dance clubs, uh, and there were all kinds during the Victorian era. Era, there were all kinds of dance clubs uh, running in CC, and this was true um, in all across the United States. Uh, but really, what these were, they were ways that uh, young people, young single people, could get together in kind of a, a, a supervised, respectable manner uh, and, and meet each other, and oftentimes uh, eventually find a, a, you know someone to marry. Uh, and so, beginning at age eighteen, uh, a, a young woman would be. Uh, Brought to one of these uh, dances at uh, one of the dance clubs, uh, and but th they wouldn't always dance with the same partner. They the, the backs of these uh, uh, cards there would have the program that was danced that evening, and the the lady would would list who she danced each dance with, who which partner, uh, and we have we have all kinds of these. They were they were very common. It's interesting. Sometimes they come from. Uh, uh, People that eventually went on to, you can see one of the partners that the, the lady danced with eventually became her husband. And so this was a way that uh, uh, people got together in, in, the, uh, uh, in the late 19th century. In 
Now we'll go into our next costume case. This is a, a, a selection of clothing from the 1890s. Uh, you can see things have, have changed already. So this, this particular dress, it's kind of a cotton dress uh, that belonged to Flora Sherling uh, of Sioux City. And it, it, uh, it, first off, it, it's less, it, it would not have had a, been worn with a bustle for one thing. Uh, and while it still has uh, a, a pretty tight waist, it's not that real tight uh, corset type waist that we had in, in the 1880s dress. Uh, this is more of what you'd call a shirt waist type uh, uh, upper bodice of, of the dress, uh, which were, this was pretty common all the way through the, the early 19 teens even was the, the shirt waist type look. Uh, but but it's a little less restricted dress. Uh, this is probably not as dressy a dress as that first one that we saw. Uh, and then again, we have another example of a, a beaded purse in the background. If you look, this is another floral motif uh, uh, beaded purse. This particular one uh, belonged to a lady named Grace Richardson who carried this at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. So I, we have a specific story with that. Uh, as far as the hats, uh, you can see the, the bonnets were pretty uh, were pretty popular in the in the 1890s. Um, this one's got some floral trim and, and a silk ribbon. Uh, you have more of a toque style hat here that would have sat on top of the head, and it's got a big ostrich plume on it. Uh, beginning in the 1890s, uh, feathers became really popular. As we'll see as we go along, feathers were increasingly popular in the early into the early 1900s. Uh, but again, hats though were not generally very large in the 1890s. They were still more of the, the bonnet uh, and toque style that were fairly, uh, uh, didn't go a long ways outside of the um, frame of the head, uh, which would really change in the early 20th century. And again, in, as far as shoes, we have a, a button up pair of, of leather boots uh, in this case, uh, and then more of a, 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 a pump style shoe. Uh, it, as far as a, you know, a high-heeled pump style shoe toward the bottom of the case. All right, let's go to, I believe we have another costume case coming up. This, uh, this case then would represent clothing more from the first decade of, of the 20th century, so the period 1900 to uh, 1910. And in this case, the, the dress is uh, something that was quite popular for summer wear, uh, a white, uh, lawn or, or uh, Batiste uh, style uh, dress, which was real common summer wear. Like uh, we, have, we have some great pictures of groups of people at Riverside Park in, in, during this period in the early 1900s. And the ladies a lot of times will be wearing a dress like this. This, this one uh, belonged to a, a lady named Florence Pleissart. And I believe it was probably from when she was, it's a very small dress. It, it, was, it probably was when she was a, a teenager, probably say 16 to 18 years old or so. Uh, so she wasn't quite an adult when when she wore wore this dress, uh, but but again something fairly common. Uh, you can see less less formal maybe than the first two dresses that we wore, and and more practical for for summer wear. Now as far as the the there is a, a purse back here. Another it's another beaded purse this time with a with a, a metal chain type handle, and this has a peacock uh, motif to it. Uh, and th this, I, I, I think anyway, the, 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 the uh, style of this is kind of fitting into the Art Nouveau type uh, style of the early 20th century where uh, natural forms uh, were used as, as inspiration for some of the decoration on, on all kinds of things uh, uh, in, in, as far as uh, uh, fashion and in, in art itself. Uh, now, it, beginning in, in the early 1900s, hats there, that you need to have kind of the toque style hat, which this is a really elaborately feathered uh, example. Uh, and then we have below uh, more of a, uh, a, a wider brimmed variety with very elaborate uh, feather, uh, feather decoration. Uh, and this reminds me of the types of hats that were worn really more around what we sometimes call the Titanic era. So that the, the Titanic uh, sank in, in 1912. Uh, and so, you know, this hat probably actually dates from more like that period, 1908 to 1912. Uh, uh, but uh, you, you'll see, though, that feathers really, really were popular in the first 20, 20 years of the 20th century. And they were so popular uh, that actually many species of wild birds down in, in Florida, 
uh, in the Everglades region were hunted almost to extinction because they were used so wild, widely uh, on, on women's hats during this year. And in fact, some examples would have entire birds on, on the hats. They could be really, really elaborate and over the top. Uh, we, we have a different type of purse here at the bottom. It's more of a, a, of, a um, of a homemade variety made out of old shoelaces and then it has an interior of, of, of a satin interior. Uh, and it's, you know, very much a, of a, um, a macrame style purse that probably that the owner would have originally made themselves, but it made a, a pretty, uh, pretty uh, neat uh, accoutrement for for someone to one to use now as far as clothes or as far as uh, uh shoes are concerned uh, we have a, a small pair of uh, patent leather boots uh, you see more patent leather shoes so uh, a leather that's kind of has a uh, a slick um hard surface to it that's kind of a, a an enamel type surface or a shellac type surface uh, over lower grade uh, leather became quite popular in the in the early 20th century uh, and then Below the shoes are actually a, a, a lady's Oxford style shoe. And this is a kind of shoe that uh, uh, a woman would have worn to, to work, like if she worked in an office or maybe as a teacher uh, or uh, at some other occupation. Women were increasingly uh, going into the workforce in the early uh, 20th century. It's certainly nothing like it would later be, but uh, uh, but but more than they had in 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 earlier times, and so this is a more of a practical style uh, shoe uh, for, for women of that period. All right, let's go to the next case. Now we we have a case of some uh, early Sioux City women's clubs, and the, the women's club movement in Sioux City and nationally really uh, took hold in in in, the, in at the beginning of the 1890s. Now there were as, as we saw, there were earlier uh, women's organizations like the Women's Christian Association and the WCTU. They usually were focused on a specific uh, yeah, social betterment uh, type uh, um, of a goal. Uh, but the, the women's clubs of, of the 1890s and after mostly began uh, as literary clubs. So these were clubs that uh, uh, would read books uh, or, or study a particular topic and then talk about it. And so they were they were interest, They were engaged in academic uh, pursuits, and it, which was, you know, more and more women were getting a, a better education during this period, and, and I think these women's clubs were uh, reflective of that. And a lot of times, the, you know, they, they, these were clubs largely led by uh, middle class to upper middle class women, somewhat, you know, and women of, the, of probably the upper class in 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 the particular city in question. Uh, but a lot of these clubs evolved from being literary clubs to being civic betterment clubs, social uh, uh, welfare clubs, uh, and then eventually became strong advocates of, of women's suffrage, particularly after 1910. Uh, and so a lot of the leaders of the final, kind of the final stages of the women's suffrage movement oftentimes came from uh, these women's suffrage club or women's study clubs, uh, where they, you know, first off, uh, engaged in in academic pursuits uh but also uh became um practiced in public speaking uh and in in making an argument and things like that 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 proved to be useful uh during during the uh suffrage activities so we have we have a uh we have a scrapbook here from sioux city's women doses club uh, which was organized in 1906 uh, and women doses uh stands for um uh, I believe it stands for wife, mother, and daughter. So it's a conglomeration. Uh, and there, there were branches of Wimidosis all over the United States. But this is a, uh, we have a picture of the, the early uh, members of the, of the Sioux City Wimidosis Club. Uh, and they would meet at, uh, at members' houses or sometimes at uh, other facilities like the Unitarian Church or other churches uh, and, uh, and, and have their meetings. Uh, another early one was the Fortnightly Club. Uh, the Fortnightly Club was uh, formed in 1890, so it was one of the, the earliest uh, study women's study clubs. Uh, and it as probably, as you would guess, they met every two weeks, uh, hence the name uh, Fortnightly. Uh, and so that, that's a, another example. Uh, also in this case, we have a, a book written by Julia Clark Hallam. Uh, it's 
it's it's a it's called the story of a European tour, and it's about a a, a trip to Europe that she took with her husband in in the, in 19, 1900. And then she came back and wrote uh, basically an account of their adventures in Europe. But uh, Julia Clark Hallam was was one of the leading suffragists uh, in Sioux City. Uh, she eventually uh, became president of the Iowa Equal Suffrage Association in in uh, 1909 and served a, a term as that. And uh, she was uh, probably Sioux City's most prominent example of a, of a true suffragette uh, of the more militant uh, variety of suffragist, uh, somebody that was for things like uh, marches and uh, and uh, um, protesting at the the state house and, and uh, that kind of thing that was considered uh, militant tactics at, at that time for for women to be engaged in. Uh, and then the other thing that we have in this case are a couple of. Uh, of letters uh, that were written by Mary Safford, the, the uh, pastor at the First Unitarian Church, to uh, Dr. William Rimson Smith. Uh, and William Rimson Smith was a, a Sioux City pioneer who came to Sioux City in 1856. Uh, he was he was a physician, uh, and he was one of the founders of the Unitarian Church here. And so these are just some uh, just deep kind of personal letters that uh, Safford wrote to to Smith uh, when she was a. Uh, uh, away, I think one of them she had taken a trip uh, to, to to Germany, uh, and she was writing back about what was going on. And another one, she was at some kind of conference, and she was, was writing back to tell him what uh, was going on at the conference. So, uh, just some personal items related to to Mary Safford, who was uh, an important suffragist from Sioux City. And now we have another costume case. This one. Uh, is is more from the period right around 1910, say uh, 1910 to 1915. Uh, first off, the, the dress is a is more of an elaborate uh, formal evening dress that belonged to Ethel Cord, uh, and Ethel, I believe, was from uh, I, I believe from Danbury, but I, I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, uh, but it, it is a uh, uh, it, silk dress, uh, and you can see that, that things had really changed. Still has a pretty tight waist, but much looser fitting up above, and so you can see quite a uh, quite a transition happening there. Uh, in this case, we have a uh, small purse. It's a, a small metal purse, and these these uh, metal purses were real popular in the, in the early 1900s, uh, from say 1900 through the 1920s into uh, the 1930s, uh, and they were they were. Uh, sometimes they would be more. Sometimes it'd be more of an Art Nouveau type uh, decoration, and then eventually in the 1920s, more of an Art Deco with real stylized uh, um, decorations on them. Uh, as far as hats, we have a couple of uh, pretty uh, common hats of that period. One is uh, a garden hat, uh, so uh, kind of a, a floppy brimmed, but much wider brim. So you can see it during this period after 1910, the wide brimmed hat became quite popular. Uh, and this this particular hat style reminds me of first off it kind of reminds me of a of a sailor's hat like a, the type of uh, um, rain hat that that might have been worn uh, by a sailor. But the other thing it reminds me of is the the tight more tight fitting cloche uh, style hat of the of the nineteen twenties, and that this was maybe a forerunner of that uh, style. And then probably the most famous type of hat during this the 19 teens was the, the picture hat, the very broad brimmed hat. Sometimes these hats, these are the hats that would oftentimes have a whole bird sitting on, on them for decoration. This one has an ostrich feather, uh, the example that we have here. Uh, and then as far as uh, uh, we have a pair of shoes here, uh, a pair of boots, uh, of button up boots, and these are just leather uh, button up boots. Uh, so boots were still uh, in, in fashion for uh, women, particularly in the winter months. Uh, and then we also have a, uh, a velvet uh, type purse with, with, a, uh, uh, with, with a metal top, a kind of a brass uh, lid. And that's another example of the, the type of purse that might have been used during this period in the 19-teens. Okay, let's go to the next. So in this case, we have, uh, it, it's kind of a mixture of artifacts related to uh, political figures uh, from Iowa and uh, that some that related to the suffrage movement, uh, and then of some uh, specific artifacts 
uh, from suffragists in in Sioux City. So first, let's let's point out the the political figures. I, I want to talk about those. So here in the back, we have uh, a a um, ribbon uh, that a pinback ribbon that's from the inauguration of, of Frank D. Jackson, who became, was elected governor of Iowa uh, in 1894, and he was the he was a, a Republican who replaced a Democrat. And so that's why it says Iowa redeemed because Iowa was, was really dominated by the Republicans from the, uh, from the civil war up through the 1930s into, you know, all the time of, uh, of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the new deal. Uh, and so in a, in a rare exception to that was a Democrat had preceded Jackson in, in office. Uh, and, and so the Republicans came back in power with Jackson uh, but Jackson also was the, uh, the the governor when women in Iowa received the first uh, um, limited suffrage. So in 1894, the Iowa State Legislature uh, voted to allow uh, adult women in Iowa to vote in local uh, school bond and tax uh, bond uh, elections. Uh, and so that, that was a, a type of limited suffrage that they were able to achieve in 1894. And so Jackson would have had to have approved that, which he did. Uh, we have a couple of small uh, pin back buttons here. Uh, one, oh, I'm going to go in, they're going to be a little blurry because of the resolution, but uh, uh, the first one we have is is a, a, a pin back button for Senator William B. Allison, and Allison is one of uh, Iowa's most legendary senators. He served uh, six full terms as, as senator from 1873 to 1908. Uh, and he was actually running for a seventh term in 1908, and he was able to defeat uh, Albert Cummins, who had been Iowa governor and was, became a very uh, um, famous uh, progressive politician during the 19, you know, early 1900s. Uh, Cummins was this more old style, uh, or uh, Allison was more this old style Republican, uh, and he was able to beat out uh, uh, Allison or Cummins in uh, in in a primary in in June of 1908, uh, but then died suddenly in August of 1908. So he didn't get to to run uh, for for um, <clears throat> to actually run in in the general election that year. And so instead, Cummins ended up being nominated and went on to become Iowa senator. Uh, and then another pin back button we have is for Williams Jennings Bryan, uh, and Williams Jennings Bryan was a congressman from Nebraska. And he eventually, he really came to dominate the Democratic Party in the 1890s through about 1910 uh, and nominated for president three times uh, and lost all three uh, elections. But he was still a very, he had ser he served as uh, Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson uh, and came to Sioux City in 1916 when, the, when Iowa was uh, holding a referendum on uh, allowing women's suffrage. Uh, in, in 1916, um, Brian was brought in to speak in behalf of women's suffrage uh, here in Sioux City and actually throughout the state. He was a, a noted orator uh, during this time period. I, and th as far as other political objects, we have a couple related to William Lloyd Harding. Now, William Lloyd Harding uh, was born in Sibley, Iowa, uh, but he attended Morningside College in, in the early late 1890s, early 1900s. Uh, and then graduated from University of South Dakota Law School. Uh, and then after that, came back to Sioux City and worked as a lawyer. Uh, but in 1906, he won election to uh, the, the Iowa State Legislature. Uh, and so what we have here, we have his desk key uh, from his time in, in the Iowa Legislature between 1907 and 1913. And then in 1912, he won uh, election to, to the office of Lieutenant Governor. Uh, and served two terms as lieutenant governor, and this is his office key uh, from for to his office down at the state house uh, in Des Moines uh, while he was lieutenant governor. Of course, as lieutenant governor, he was the the president of the Iowa Senate, uh, and this is the gavel that he used as, during his uh, service as as president of the of the Iowa Senate. Uh, so we have some pretty neat uh, objects related directly to Harding. Hi. We also have uh, a, a newspaper clipping here. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, former governor of New Jersey, was running for president in 1912. And during his campaign, he stopped in Sioux City. This is a picture of Wilson in Sioux City. 
uh, and he spoke out at uh, um, he spoke out at the interstate fairgrounds, which were out in Riverside, uh, approximately where where Fairway is today in, in Riverside. Uh, and then he also spoke downtown and out at uh, out at Morningside College uh, when he was here in 1912. Now, th the other artifacts we have in this case, I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. The, the first uh, women's suffrage organization organized in um, in Sioux City was the Sioux City Political Equality Club. Uh, and it was organized in 1889. And it was actually, um, the organization was led by Carrie Chapman Catt, who was from Charles City, Iowa, uh, and would go on to be um, the, the leader of the National American Women's Suffrage Association uh, during two different uh, stints in the early 1900s and then from 1915 to 1920. Uh, and it was really outside of uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony was probably the most prominent uh, uh, suffragist uh, during the whole time, uh, with the possible exception of Alice Paul uh, during the later period of the, of the suffrage movement. So she was involved in, in forming the Equality Club. Uh, in this, in this uh, scrapbook page, uh, it's kind of hard to see in, in a newspaper photo, but uh, the, the, the members of the Political Equality Club in, in the early 1900s staged a, a play uh, called Put to the Test. And they dressed up in, it's all women, but they dressed up, uh, they played both male and female roles. And so we, here we have the cast of, of, of the, uh, the actors and they staged this play in the, in, at the First Unitarian Church where this photo was taken. Uh, and so we have, uh, you can see, women with mustaches and things like that, but they're, they're all ladies in this picture. Uh, the other artifact that we have here that was related to the women's suffrage movement was the, the child, anti-child labor movement. And that was always a concern of, of uh, suffragists uh, throughout, uh, really throughout this period. So uh, this was a, a time when there really wasn't any regulation on, on child labor in the United States. Uh, and and suffragists and suffrage related organizations almost always were were strong advocates of of either banning or reducing uh, child labor. And so this is a, a certificate of membership uh, to the Anti Child Slavery League, which was one of these uh, uh, these uh, anti uh, child labor organizations that that uh, w was active at this period in the in the United States and oftentimes speakers from uh, the 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 anti child labor organizations would come and uh, and give sp uh, speeches in behalf of of women's suffrage kind of like the WCTU uh, supported women's suffrage as well okay now we get uh, a, another costume case. Now this particular case is kind of, would represent clothing mostly from later in the 19 teens. So say the period 1915 to 1920, uh, we have a, uh, we have a kind of an elaborately beaded dress uh, here in front. This belonged to uh, Jesse Martin uh, and it, it's a very nice uh, silk, very fine, uh, silk dress uh, with, with very elaborate beading and kind of a floral motif. It, it has, to me, a very Art Nouveau type uh, design to it. Uh, in the background, you can see a, a, a leather handbag uh, hanging in the background. And then in the, as far as the hats, we have, we have another picture hat below with an with a ostrich feather. Uh, and then this uh, is kind of a... Um, I guess you'd call it a Shakespearean uh, style hat uh, th with with more elaborate uh, feather decorations. And so a little bit of a different uh, style of hat uh, from this period. Uh, and then as far as shoes, we have another set of uh, button up boots. See the, the boots that are more of a rounded toe variety instead of the more pointed toe that we saw. Well, even we see in, the, in this pair of shoes here, Th these are a pair of, uh, of uh, button up uh, or of button strapped uh, pumps uh, type shoes. All right, now we're getting toward the last couple of cases. Uh, we'll go another costume case. Now, the, the dress you see here is the inaugural gown uh, that Carrie Harding, the wife of William Lloyd Harding, wore uh, to 
William Lloyd Harding's second inauguration as Iowa governor. So William Lloyd Harding uh, had served in the Iowa legislature and then served two terms as uh, Iowa's lieutenant governor. And then in 1916, won election to the, the governorship of Iowa. Uh, and then won re-election in 1918. In those days, uh, the Iowa, the Iowa, the term for Iowa governor was was only two years. Uh, he won re-election in 1918, and so this is uh, the dress that uh, Kerry Harding wore to his second inauguration, which would have been in early 19, uh, 19, uh, 19. Uh, But this is uh, it, it, it's it's a, a beaded dress. It's got a very fine uh, um, net type uh, sleeves. Uh, I believe this this dress was actually made by Walter Ward Harding, uh, who was uh, an uncle of William Lloyd, who was, uh, was a dressmaker and a hat maker. Uh, and, and a lot of the clothing from, from Carrie Harding uh, was actually made by uh, Walter Ward Harding. Um, other things we have in here are a couple more dresses or a couple more hats. We have another Kind of a toque style hat that has uh, um, ha has feathers, but you can't see it real well. But this hat, this is one of Carrie Harding's hats, and it actually has about half of a bird. It's got a bird head on it, <laughs> and is uh, uh, quite an uh, elaborate uh, piece of work. And then we have another picture style hat with with more feathers, and so you really see the the feathers became a, a really popular uh, trim for hats uh, in the in the early 1900s. I, and we happen to have both of these sets of shoes were Carrie Harding's shoes, and this pair on the top were, were the shoes that she wore with this inaugural dress. Uh, but both are, are pump style uh, uh, women's shoes. Uh, the ones below are more of a silk uh, style, uh, where the, the ones on top that were worn with the inaugural dress are beaded. Apologize for running a little long with the presentation, but we're down to the last uh, couple of cases here. We do have a uh, we have a, a whole uh, case full of of artifacts related directly to William Lloyd Harding. Now, Harding was is the only uh, governor of Iowa from Sioux City that was actually from Sioux City. Uh, so he served two terms as Iowa governor, and he was governor during the period when uh, uh, when uh, the Nineteenth Amendment uh, was was passed and. Iowa became the 10th uh, state to, to ratify the 19th Amendment in, in July of 1919. Uh, Harding himself was not, uh, a, he, he was kind of ambivalent about women's suffrage, but he was never a strong opponent to, of it. And as governor, he uh, he always, the, the Republican Party seems to, in, at least in Iowa, seems to have determined that it was in favor of women's suffrage uh, by about 1915 or so. Uh, and Harding went went along with that, uh, you know, and, and actually became a, a fairly strong advocate of, of women's suffrage later in, in, during his time as governor. Uh, in in the the case, we have a, a top hat that Harding wore to the inaug the presidential inaugurations of of Woodrow Wilson when he won re-election uh, in in 1916. So Harding would have worn that at the inauguration in 1917, and then he wore it. Uh, to uh, to Wilson's successor uh, Warren G. Harding's inauguration in early 1921. Uh, so so that hat was worn to two presidential inaugurations. Uh, in the background, we have a couple of posters uh, from Harding's campaign for his first term as governor in 1916. Uh, so uh, one of them is for the the Republican primary uh, that year. And then the, the the more colorful one is from the general election that November. Now Harding was the uh, governor during World War One, uh, and he became fairly infam infamous in Iowa um, uh, history because uh, um, governors were under strong uh, uh, pressure to uh, raise money for what were called the Liberty Loan drives in in during World War One, which was a way to uh, uh, after the U.S. entered the war in 1917, it was the Liberty Loans were a way for the, gov the government to raise money from the American people through the sale of, of war bonds. Uh, and so we have a we have a little door uh, sign for, for the third Liberty Loan campaign of 1918. Uh, in, in May of 1918, 
Harding issued his famous uh, language proclamation or Babel proclamation, which uh, banned the speaking of any language other than, than English in, in public, which included in, in church uh, or over the phone or, or uh, uh, any, other, any other type of public speaking. Uh, and uh, which, of course, was not popular at all with the uh, the rather large immigrant community in Iowa, but uh, but in, but it uh, went into force. Uh, and the the on the other side of that, the Liberty Loan campaigns were quite uh, were quite successful in in Iowa. In fact, I I believe the third Liberty Loan campaign, Iowa was the first to reach its quota for it. Uh, and so, uh, Harding's kind of strong arm tactics were fairly effective. We have a picture. I do like the picture we have off to the side as a um, um, kind of a, uh, a prize for counties reaching their quota on the Liberty Loans. Carrie Harding sewed a, an American flag and here she is uh, working on the flag with her with their daughter Barbara who was born in 1915. Uh, and if you if the, the state that raised the money for the third Liberty Loan the fastest got this flag and uh, in the end, uh, Shelby County uh, won it, so that's where the the city of Harlan is. The so that's in western, uh, kind of southwestern Iowa uh, won the the that flag. All right, and then we have a, a another one last case of of suffrage and, and political uh, related items. Uh, I first off, we have. A picture of the uh, um, the oh, a Sioux City Women's uh, Political League uh, and a couple of the members here. Uh, in 1916, Iowa held a referendum, uh, and at that time, of course, all the voters were male, uh, and there was a referendum uh, to allow women the, the vote, uh, and it. it, it it was it drew suffragists from all across the United States, uh, there, and there were there were people that came to uh, support uh, the passage of the referendum, and there were those that came to oppose it. Uh, and this is in Sioux City, being in the, the largest, the second largest city in Iowa at the time, and the largest city in Western Iowa, uh, was, was really an active scene during the the run up to that referendum, which was held in June of 1916. Uh, in the end, it lost narrowly statewide by about 10,000 votes uh, and it, it barely lost in, in uh, Woodbury County uh, by I believe 127 votes. So it was a very close election uh, which unfortunately was not successful and so s s Iowa women had to wait until the uh, ratification of, of the 20th or of the 19th amendment to um, to achieve the vote uh, in, because uh, the, the state legislature was not able to get that through. Uh, now, after the passage of the 19th uh, Amendment, after it was ratified, which occurred in August of 1920, uh, women were eligible to vote in the 1920 presidential elections. Uh, and as a, since that basically doubled the electorate in Sioux City, uh, the, the number of voting precincts in Sioux City had to be, I think that it, there had been 14 and they had to be expanded to 27. Uh, and so here we have a map of Sioux City uh, showing the different voting precincts for the 1920 uh, general election. We also have a few, we have a, a couple of buttons. Really our, our only two artifacts that we have specifically relating to women's suffrage uh, here in Iowa are these two votes for women uh, buttons that were put out during the run up to that 1916 referendum. So we have two small pin back buttons. Uh, and we have a couple other uh, political uh, buttons uh, Thomas Steele was a, a U.S. congressman from Sioux City in uh, um, in between 1914 and 1918, uh, and then uh, Charles Lytle uh, served in the Iowa legislature in 1916 to 1918. All right, let's go to the other part of this case. Uh, a couple of other very cool artifacts. Uh, first off, we have a certificate here uh, from the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which was the leading national uh, pro-women's suffrage organization uh, led by Carrie Chapman Catt, uh, originally founded by um, in, in 1890 uh, and, and led by Susan Anthony and, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And so this was the 
uh, most important women's suffrage organization. Uh, and this is a, a certificate of, of, uh, of special achievement that was, uh, uh, was given to uh, uh, somebody connected to, to Sioux City. Um, I, I believe, I think the, the lady's name was Laura Bailey. Uh, but uh, she was from Dunlap, Iowa, and she got this. Uh, she she got this uh, certificate signed by Carrie Chapman Cat. Uh, we also have a little business card from uh, Charles Locke or Lockie, who was a lawyer here in Sioux City, and he was a a, a, a pro suffrage uh, uh, man, man here in Sioux City that was was fairly prominent during the the uh, 1916 uh, referendum campaign. And then the other uh, really neat thing we have is the uh, a, a bulletin and, and, and a, a couple of things from the Dames uh, Club of, of Sioux City. And the, the Dames Club uh, was the first African-American women's club, uh, and, and it was formed in, in the fall of 1920. Uh, now, whether that was inspired by the, the, the achievement of suffrage or not, I, I, I'm not sure of that, but uh, during the, the World War I period was when the African-American population of Sioux City grew fairly substantially. Uh, and one of the first things that, that happened as, as that uh, community grew was uh, a, a black women's club was formed. Uh, and, uh, and so this, th these are a couple of items related to that. And so I, I, it, it kind of shows you had, and, and keep in mind, Sioux City wasn't a, an officially segregated city like you may have had in the American South, but uh, most likely during this period, the, the other women's clubs would not have been uh, open to, to African American women, uh, and so they instead formed their their own uh, women's club. And that that uh, organization uh, continued to operate until the early 1980s. Okay, now let's finish up with a couple of costume cases. Uh, here we have a. Uh, Red Cross nurses uniform. I do not know who the original owner of this was, but during World War One, one of the things that really pushed uh, the, the the women's suffrage across the finish line uh, was the role women played during World War One. After the U.S. entered the war in 1917, over eight million women volunteered for the Red Cross, and, and many of them served as nurses uh, in, overseas over in Europe, uh, taking care of uh, American servicemen uh, serving in, uh, serving on the Western Front. And so here we have a, a Red Cross, the, the, the nurse's uniform and the hat in the background. There's also a handkerchief you, you can see on the, down here. Uh, we, there's a, we have a pamphlet that talks about the different things the Red Cross does and there's a little button. Uh, the other thing is gonna be kind of hard to see in this case, but uh, Go down to the bottom. Uh, this little, the little pin back button here at the bottom, the green one, uh, that's from the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and they had a, a campaign called Soldiers of the Soil, uh, and they, the, the NA uh, WSA really strongly supported the the war effort during World War One, uh, and uh, encouraged uh, women to plant things like victory gardens uh, and to, uh, to volunteer for farm work because of course a lot of farmers were in service during during the war and so farm labor was in short supply and so many women uh, volunteered uh, to work uh, to, to um, bring the crops in and to plant the crops and things like that uh, for, even if they hadn't gr grown up on farms and then finally the last uh, artifact we have is a um, uh, a young uh, men's Christian association, so a YMCA uh, um, canteen uniform. So this was worn by Ethel Chesterman, who is a, a, a member of the, the Chesterman of the Chesterman bottling family here in Sioux City. Uh, and Ethel as a young lady uh, volunteered for service with the YMCA uh, at a canteen that they uh, ran over in, in France during the war. And so these canteens were places that uh, men could go to uh, for um, entertainment uh, and for all different types of, of, of services. And so uh, this, this is another way that women uh, participated in, in the war effort. And so this is uh, Ethel Chesterman's uh, uniform from that and very much looks like a, um, a, a, a women's military uniform, something that would have been uh, worn by a, a lady serving the army in which uh, there were uh, many, tens of thousands of women either served in the 
Army, particularly in the Army, uh, in the in the Signal Corps, oftentimes they worked as uh, telephone operators, um, and they also served in the U.S. Navy. Uh, there, there was a, a little loophole in the in the regulations for uh, service in the U.S. Navy during World War One, and something like eleven thousand American women served in the Navy during during the war. Uh, and so now that's uh, that's the last of our our artifacts. I hope that uh, everyone that's participate in this has enjoyed the, the, the perusal of, of the artifacts in our suffrage exhibit. Uh, I, I do encourage anyone that can uh, to, to come down to the museum and, and uh, take a look at these things for themselves. Um, uh, it, this should be available to, to look at in, in more detail uh, on our Facebook page uh, hereafter, but uh, thanks again for, for participating and uh, hope to, to see all of you eventually down at our facility. Thank you.